Thank you. And our next speaker is Paul Muller. And Paul um, is such an a, a iconic pioneer in American organic movement. Um, Paul is one of the four partners at Full Belly Farm in California. And I have heard about it for many years before I met Paul. And uh, I know that uh, a number of people, even in this room, worked there and got their start in farming and learned from them. Um, and uh, they're so uh, generous in their open-heartedness to sharing their knowledge as well as their food. So Paul and Drew and the people at Full Belly actually hosted one of the rallies in 2017 during their hoedown, um, hose down, hose down uh, <laughs> festival. So Paul. So um, I first of all want to say that it's an honor to be here. And Dave has, is a skilled butter upper. It's hard to come here thinking I'm an iconic anything. Um, um, and certainly um, my um, joining the uh, Real Organic Project has made me realize, again, how much genius there is in this movement and how much time that we have to honor, uh, take time to honor those who have come before us and taken an idea and built it into an industry and how those same people now say, are saying, we need a course direction. We need an adjustment here because what we created is, is beginning to move away from what we intend it to be. And the strength in this room and the strength of the people who are doing this, this work will have the, have, have the potency, the power to change that. So I really believe that we are now at the moment of a new point in the organic not narrative. So it's an honor to be here. And I, I start with, you know, what, what got me into organic farming? And it's, and it's in a sense, it's, a, it's, a, it's what we've been talking about all day, that the farmers I saw when I grew up on a dairy farm in San Jose and the forces that I saw um, creating a different narrative in, in the lives of so many farmers. And, those, and if you lived in the 50s and 60s and 70s, you saw farms going out of business, good farms disappearing from the American landscape, people who could have been great stewards and who would have been great stewards. And they disappeared for the same reason that Alan talked about today, concentration, um, um, uh, uh, lack of access to market, um, injustice, capitalist, capital that was accumulated and pushed them out. It was, they were seen, and when I went to college, they were seen as surplus capital, human capital in the rural sector that could be moved out and moved to cities. We're still in that paradigm. And one of the things I think we need to think about is how we change that paradigm. Whoops, what was that? Okay, so full belly. They had 400 acres, we're about 450 acres. I hope we're not uh, offending anybody by being that big, but we're trying to fi figure out a scale that we can exist in this marketplace. And this is where we've grown to over 35 years. We have 100 different crops. We have sheep in the system, chickens. Uh, my wife keeps cows as pets. Um, we do cover crops. On the field, we've extensively cover cropped over time. We have 80 year-round employees. 35 years, we've been certified organic. Um, we've developed hedgerows and insectaries around the farm. We do diversified marketing. Um, we try to be open, transparent, and collaborative and try and make our farm something that people can learn from. We have interns who are people we want to grow for new farmers. We have six partner owners, so we try to diversify our skills there. And as we have uh, 35 or so, or, or 80 or so employees, we have 25 families that get their primary income from the work of our farm. So we've created a community in a farm. Um, and we try to be politically active. We want to celebrate a few things. And I think the, the, the talks today have been powerful. But I think what we need to come out of this with is a sense that we are creating the, the alternative vision for what agriculture might be. We have the power here to recreate hope and reconnect people to possibilities that don't exist when you see the, the principal paradigm of agriculture that's been driving it for so long is produce more for less. We don't have a food and a hunger problem in this, in this, in this country. We have a food justice, food access, food equitability uh, uh, issue, and we have the wrong paradigm that's saying you need to produce it for less. So we have to... If we're going to think about how we restructure the model, make the old model obsolete, that's our work as we leave from here. 
we have to take this knowledge and begin to apply it in ways that we are connecting, reconnecting, and reformulating the community of people who are connected to good food. So one way we do that is with beauty. And my life, wife loves to, to grow flowers. And a flower is her love on the farm. I love to grow crops. And I have to say we came from the school of uniformity. And we're, we're, we're leaving that school soon. We come from the school of, 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 of a uniformity as a, an expression of beauty. And beauty is something that drives the eye. We've come from the, uh, the school of where we're manipulating soil. And we grow these beautiful cover crops, cover crops like Emily had, and we look in the ground and we know we've made a difference. But we've adopted a paradigm. And I'm going to tell you that I'm, I'm doing a lot of things wrong. And, but, I want, and, but, but I want to be at the end of my life saying I've learned from what I did wrong and I'm now doing them better. We've adopted a paradigm that says compost and cover crops are a substitute just for fertility, an input kind of thinking that is, is not very much different than, than where conventional farmers are now. When they have a problem, they look for an input. These are biological processes, but we're, we're treating them as inputs and, we're not, and not fully considering the biological uh, processes underneath the soil. So we've been manipulating soil over time and we think we're not doing the best we can do. So we, we are looking to think about soil health in different ways. Our farm is, is, is complex. It has, um, we tried to think about many layers on the farm. We, think, we constantly think about how our stewardship is our promise to our consumers. So we're looking for ways that we can relate more intimately to consumers all the time. The earthworms in this picture and the earthworms that were shown, um, um, we can consider livestock on a good organic farm. Right? They, they, they're, if you have 25 worms in a, in a square foot, uh, foot of soil, you have a million worms per acre. A million worms will turn over 700 pounds or create 700 pounds of castings a day. If you have your biological system working, you're going to create the fertility and you're going to have the livestock underneath your soil doing their work to make your system better. You can design a farm where you're attracting beneficial insects. You're growing the, the other things you need on your farm to create diversity. So around our farm, we have hedgerows. We've, we've, we've interspersed our farm with, with orchards and hedgerows, places where we can grow things for insects. We try to design a farm that's multi-storied and taking advantage of the potential that can be created when you put these different layers of life together. And a lot of times you stand back and you see that maybe even what you there's a serendipitous relationship. You may never have anticipated what you're going to find, but when you create complexity, it shows up. So it's a remarkable thing. Nature is ready to help us in its healing. So if we have principles at the farm, and um, I think we do our, have some principles, um, that we look to seek the, to build the health of all parts. And we maximize the utility of what I'll call indigenous resources. And what are your indigenous resources on your farm? <coughs> a farm ha can have more harvest per acre if you think about the pow what powers your farm is sunlight. Sunlight powers the photosynthetic process that makes plants grow. Those, those plants growing and those living roots in the soil feed this soil microlife through the root exudates they make. It's a very um, um, 50 million years of, of, of development of the grasslands in, and the, the ecology of grasslands has created this system that will live far beyond us. Uh, 50 million years from now, it will still be the system that's, that's being driven by sunlight and plants. So we are, in fact, trying to manage that by maximizing the indigenous resources that we have on the farm to create more complexity and, and, and more stability. Um, we create markets differentiation with flavor, education, and community relationships. We cannot create a new model and the, uh, without beginning to think about maximizing all of our community relationships, connecting new places in the community to your farm and to other farms. You cannot create a new model if farms see themselves as individual families out there fighting it out because we all have to think about how we create new, uh, uh, new associations, right? New connecting new parts of your community that heretofore haven't been connected knowing that they need to support you as a farmer, because you're essential to the well-being of the whole community. We have to think about how we do that uh, market differentiation by through association. We know we're building safer farms. We know we want to solve for pattern, and the pattern that we want to solve for is diversity, richness, diversity in all, in the human diversity that we have around our agriculture, diversity of all the layers of life that you can have on your farm, and thinking about whole systems. Now, whole systems are something we can talk about a lot, but I think our, our, we've been so, so mindful of the parts and how we put parts into a system 
that we very seldom can step back and gestalt the whole. The whole is very difficult to gestalt. They say that in our soil systems, there are microbes that only exist in relationship. If you want to take a microbe out of that system and study in the lab, it won't exist anymore. It only exists in relationship. And I will say there's so many parts of our own human, human well-being and hum, human uh, communities that have been severed that we need to put to back, back together because we need to begin to understand how we exist in a healthy relationship to one another. That's, that's what farms and the, the lessons of farms can teach us. We need to develop... Um, we need to focus on carbon and feeding the soil in, in a systems approach. The, the, the notion that carbon is in the air and needs to go in the soil is essential, but that carbon in the soil and in the air becomes integral to our own physical structure. It's what uh, the carbon that comes, comes through the soil that we're, 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 we're putting in the soil as stable carbon begins to, to um, inform the plant, and again, in this association with plant and soil microbes, and what we eat in a plant is, is full of micro life that informs our gut. The, the connection between that we'll make in the future and the connection that we need to make is that the soil carbon in the air, which is a problem, and when it's put in the soil, it feeds the plants that will create a healthy ecology that will inform our gut, that will make us healthier, and we'll do what Anne talked about, begin to look at this issue of degenerative diseases. Um, so our, our structure, we have um, tried to be diverse there. We have six, six partners. Our children are starting enterprises on the farm. We have a 1,200 member CSA. We have 80 different crops. Um, for our, our markets are 15% farmer's market, 15% CSA, 30% direct to stores and restaurants, 35% wholesale, 5% education. We tried to make our farm as diverse as possible in the economic sense. Um, we are, of course, this goes back to our gut bacteria and how you bake um, you seduce this next generation. You, it, and the seduction is, is pretty insidious. You seduce them with things that are sweet, with good tasting watermelons. You seduce them with the very inoculation of their own system with the place they're living on. That inoculation goes far beyond the farm and it goes to the community of people who are living and touched by your farm. We feel like we're growing people who are intimate to our farm because we're feeding them in a way that they know where their food comes from and where they're actually receiving the inoculum on a leaf surface. And you can't watch, I mean, we, we're living in this amazing biological funk where the, the dust, on a dust particle, there can be a million microorganisms. In, in a teaspoon of living soil, there can be a billion micro, microorganisms. We're living in a world, and in, your, in your body, you have uh, uh, 10, mil, 10 trillion, or trillion cells and 10 trillion uh, microbes. You're far more microbial than you are cellular. And so we've been living in a world where we think we understand our relation to this biological funk that we're in. But in fact, we're just beginning to understand how complex it is. And we're just beginning to understand the complexity of soil. So when you think about the real organic program, what we're really doing is saying, wait a second, we're not even close to understanding the system that we're living in. We're still learning the pieces and how they fit together. And it's so presumptuous to think that you can take inputs and grow good food by substituting soy, hyd um, soy, liquid soy, or other things, and have anywhere near the, the quality of food that you might have um, from, from the food that you have, um, that, the food that you're growing in the soil. We have to be clever about how we, we approach our public. These are, this is our hose down, a piece from our Hose Down Harvest Festival. We have 6,000 people come to the farm who put their feet on our soil and on our ground, and we take them around and we talk to them. We need people to understand what you're all doing. We have to enlarge our community. Each of you now has been inoculated by the amazing speakers that have come before me, and now you need to go out and inoculate 200 more. If we do that, we become a virus. We become, <laughs> we become um, a... a, a similar to the hyphae and those uh, microbial systems there. We are beginning to create a network, and we have to begin to think about how we can mimic nature in our very association with one another. We're, we're all informed together as in working and, and taking in the sugar of information and then pushing it out and making other places that we live in far more healthy. So uh, it was talked about how we're doing this for our next generation, and this is the generation that's been inoculated. They're now farming on the farm. 
They're the ones who are going to take the, the expression of our full belly and, and recreate it and create it in their own image. And I have this the grandchildren. I now have um, uh, 10 grandchildren. And unless we think about these issues like climate change, like new associations, like resilience, and how we design for resilience, we, they're going to have a tremendously more difficult time than any generation that we've ever known. We have lived in the most amazingly abundant period of, of our history when we had the ability to extract so much and it came in so cheaply. And we have to watch the, 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 uh, um, the conversation that says, how come organic food is so expensive? And we have to go back, back to, well, how can we eat things that are so cheaply done and then we have to pay for them later? We have to rethink that, that conversation. So you grow what you love. You grow what you have an association with. You, you choose new ch strategies for accumulating carbon in the soil. You create a more vibrant, beautiful farm. And that should be a, a, a conversation that every farmer's association has and every certifier brings to a farm, is how can you make your farm more beautiful? How can we help you? It's, it's, a, um, we, it's, a, it's a way we solve for a larger pattern where we recognize beauty. It's a way that you can have a market that pays attention, and we need to find people who will pay attention. We need to think about how we survive and adapt together, because this is not individual farms out there battling this out are not going to survive. We need to survive in association with consumers and, and um, even, even people who are sympathetic to what we're doing. We need to get our co-ops to begin to get behind the idea that they're, in fact, needing to support a new generation of farmers. We have to be consistent in our thinking here all the way through, and we have to adapt together. And we have to foster creativity in our rural places, because our rural places have been all but decimated. So we ask different questions. You have to define success differently, that crop yield is ba balanced with other measurements of success, that we have to increase the total harvest per acre. Think about your farm as, as harvesting sunlight and how you increase more harvest of sunlight per acre per year. That means that when water hits your ground, you'll have effective water that'll go in the ground and stay in the ground. You want to have beneficial insects. They can provide you with services on your farm. Um, there's a huge bee issue in California right now, or this fact that we, we have an insect, insect Armageddon happening. And it's happening because we're thinking about sterility as a, a, as a real um, uh, it's a much safer agriculture, and I think we're all going to be attacked by, the, by our, our connection to biology as organic farmers. And sterility has become something that very, we're very comfortable with in thinking about how science is so exact and precise. And so we have to reassert the power of biology. Um, so we, we're thinking about building soil health and, uh, and has, uh, how organic has fundamentally always been about soil health. If you leave it with anything today, you, you leave with conviction that complex soil and what we can do as farmers in growing complex soil will produce food that's far better than anything you can grow in a, in a, in a greenhouse with, with a nu nutrient solution. So complexity comes as, as all these farmers have talked about and, and we're beginning to understand more. We've always had four or five uh, uh, species in our cover crop mix. We're going to eight to 10 to 12. We're thinking about more diversity as, as something that is, is powering our system. We're thinking, so, that, so we're thinking about how the five steps to soil health are going to be, become nearly universal. Um, that you keep soil armored or covered. You protect your soil. And, and nature has always been about protecting soil. We diversify plant species and system diversity. This is exactly what we need to do as a human community, as you talked about so eloquently. We need to diversify the human community around agriculture and the, different, and the system diversity. You need to keep living roots in the soil as much as possible, 24-7 if you can, because you're maximizing the harvest of sunlight and the photosynthetic processes driving it all. You need to minimize disruption to the soil in both mechanical and chemical, thinking about how we do less damage to what we can establish there. And I know that I'm growing cover crops right now. I have beautiful cover crops at home. And our pattern in the past, and this is what I learned as an organic farmer, was that you mow the cover crops, you work them in as quickly as possible, maybe throw some compost on there, you work that in quick, as quickly as possible because you don't want to lose the nutrients in those things. But it's been wrongheaded because I'm taking mostly, and I, we'll, we'll still do some of that because I'm, I'm, I'm slow to learn. But what we're going to do, what we're experimenting with is exactly what Jean-Paul talked about is that we're going to begin to look how we minimize that disruption so that we're maximizing what we can possibly achieve in the system. And we put animals in the system whenever possible. This is soil, okay? 
This is soil. This is what's in a soil system, and this is a, a Ray Archuleta's um, or Rudy Garcia's um, um, graphic. Um, and you're balancing biologic, physical, and chemical parts of soil. The soil is incredibly complex, 30,000 species, things they don't even know what's in there. We know maybe less than one-tenth of one percent of what's in soil. And yet we treat it so, so uh, cavalierly. We don't understand the complexity there, and we're still learning about that complexity and how the interrelationship between plants and roots create a dynamic whole down there and how we can maximize the power of that whole by thinking through how soil is, is connected to in this whole system. The piece missing from this, this graphic is the human uh, footprint above there, the, the human beings that she, are, are around that garden who they inform this very garden with their own ecology. There's a biological, I'm part of my farm. I bring my farm here to Vermont through me and I'm, I'm, I was I'd given a little bit, little bit to Emily. She was giving a little her farm to me. We're exchanging information about our very, in our very DNA about the places we live. We, our farms are in us as we are uh, making our farm be what it is. So um, that's soil. These are our c cover crops, and we can go through some of those. It's, it's, it's important to note that, that there is an eye of a farmer. Farmers see certain things as beautiful. These are fields that are, and I'm going to go to, that are, that are considered good farming practices in our region. Okay, this is what farmers are doing now. They get a, they get a crop harvest in, in uh, July or August, they work their ground and they leave it empty so that they can get a crop in the window they need to be planting in uh, in the springtime. It's completely harvesting nothing in that whole period of time. They herbicide this if there's a few weeds that come up. They'll herbicide. We have brown fields in the middle of February where they've all been herbicided down. And so this is considered good farming practice. And the, it becomes institutionalized where landlords will say, why do you have a few weeds on the edge of my field? You know, well, well what do you, what's going on here? I'll get another farmer in here if you don't take care of those weeds. It becomes institutionalized as part of the very reality that drives a system. Farmers do this because they've been squeezed into a place where this field will produce cucumbers or canning tomatoes on a schedule determined by a cannery that is a large corporation that's saying, I need your production in here February or J July 5th and, and July 6th. I need 15 loads and I need 20 loads here. And they're, doing, it's, they're treating it as a factory. The very fields we have are being treated as factories, not just our factory farms. Um, when we think about patterns, cover crops become a pattern of stewardship. Um, this is a pattern of, of uh, crop production only without anything else in it. When I left California, the fields, those fields looked like this because there was no place for water to go. And we know that California's been through drought and now been through cycles of rain. We've had our Armageddon of fire. Um, we are, um, in fact, creating the dynamism of these wide swings and ecological hazards through the very, very way we practice our agriculture and, and tend to the, eco the larger ecology. And we're creating a system that was, is inherently destructive. This is an organic field of a neighbor. You can see that it can, organic can be culpable also, and it's important to know that, that we need to improve the quality of organic production because it affects us all. Um, so, I don't know how much more time I have. Okay, so, so we are um, experimenting with roll down. We're taking cover crops. We have livestock into our, in our system. The livestock, they're, they're doing one step of digestion and inoculation, and they're, move, they're moving nutrients, and they're going to our feed, and we can take them and move them around our fields um, in, in a way um, that allows us to manage their their inputs in the system. So there are foragers and our fertilizers on, t on four legs. We're, we're creating uh, uh, cultures of, of microbes that we can add to our, add to our fields and put in our, so, so indigenous, we can create indigenous populations of microbes that can inform our seeds and get our fungal populations moving and we can add those to our seeds and we're doing that. Um, we need to, to um, appreciate the fact that this captured carbon that comes through the sun and through the plants in anywhere from 20 to 80 percent of that captured carbon goes to feed soil ecology and the population of soil biology. So we're maximizing, again, how much of that sunlight we harvest. We all have indigenous resources in our farm. We all have the potential to grow great soil. Um, agriculture has long looked at soil as a medium for that be propped up that you put inputs into. 
um, if we look at our farm as a whole organism connected to other whole organisms, we begin to, to, to see the farm very differently. And we begin to see the, the interrelationship of all the parts as being essential, whether that's living roots in the soil, the bird life, the diversity, diversity of life you can, you can foster there, the insect and, and plant diversity, uh, and soil health all become part of what you can begin to do in designing your farm. And it becomes a, the, the fundamental reason why organic farms and conventional farms are so, so, so different in what they produce. In the end, it's, it's uh, about color and flavor and, and, and growing food that you, people can taste. So our community, this is a market we've gone to for now for 35 years. We've, um, in going to a market for 35 years, you have customers who's fed their kids on your produce, and now their kids' kids are, are being served their, uh, our, our produce. We have 35 years of relationship with our customer base. And I don't know how we create uh, total security in this system, but in some ways we have to take back the direct relationship of I'm growing it, I need, I'm offering it to you. And this is why it's priced this way. This is what I'm doing on my farm. We need to command once again the information chain that's real that's not something that is, is, uh, is a uh, manufactured by a good copywriter in a large company. But it's real. It's a real exchange that's informed by flavor, informed by confidence. And, and we also need to bring people to our farm to discover the miracle, witness the miracle of what we all can take for granted. The miracle we have just, just had lambs born on the farm. The miracle of, of birth, the miracle of growth, and the miracle of, of agriculture that's in a, done in a respectful way enhances the whole vitality of the planet. Um, so I want to thank you for being here. Uh, um, coming to Vermont is a treat. Um, uh, being, having a few days of meeting with some of these amazing people has been, um, has been uh, eye-opening. We're proud to say we're a um, real organic project farm. And uh, we think that uh, we have an opportunity to change the direction of this. And we're hopeful. and. Um, and I'm not going to say we're indignant, but we are um, driven. And all the, of those of you who had a hand in creating this um, now know that we need to have a hand in creating more beauty and creating a reason for people to join with us, where what they see, it resonates with them. And what they see in their heart, they know is right. And that's a, that's a long journey, because there's a lot of things out there in the marketplace that are represented as one thing, but aren't, are something else. So it means that we have to create direct relation, direct human relations with growing a, a better food system. Thanks.